By the time Brandy Wine Productions, David Guyler, Walter Hill and Gordon Carroll, wrung more money out of Fox and approached David Toohey to write Alien 3 in March 1989, they had already gone through two other writers and a director. Eric Redd had turned in a draft that was rejected the month before, leading to the departure of director Rennie Harlan. Toohey was hired to rewrite William Gibson's original storyline of space capitalist pigs versus space commies. Unfortunately, the universe had other ideas. The Cold War was over, and Gibson's story now anachronism. Toohey changed Anchor Point Station to an orbital prison and started again. Unlike the previous scripts, Toohey's script dispenses with an opening of soldiers boarding the Sulaco, and instead we find ourselves in a meteoroid swarm and a prospecting ship collecting minerals. The rock crusher on the ship suddenly stops when a facehugger in amber is detected. Interesting that this was written prior to Michael Crichton releasing Jurassic Park the following year. The prospector retrieves it, sends a report, and goes back to work. Three years later, a shuttle approaches the Moloch Island prison orbiting Earth. Six prisoners disembark. Susan Russo, Carl Van Brunt, Cheryl Curieu, Howard Grimes, Gustavo Domingo, and Scott Stiles. Processing them is a guard called Dags. Dags explains the rules and we see the blast furnaces, the foundry, and ore processing refinery. Stiles and Van Brunt end up in the foundry raking limestone and discuss their sentences. Another prisoner named Ivory, turned white after years of working in the limestone dust, says all sentences are the same. Domingo and Curieu work in the machine shop where Domingo narrowly saves her from a load of falling pipes. Curieu says nothing. Elsewhere, Grimes watches as a massive steel ingot is launched from the station destined to splash down in the South China Sea where it's picked up. Later, Ivory is called out by the guards and bolts, only to be brought down by a bolo gun. Styles asks Dags what's going on, and the latter figures out Ivory's appeals finally ran out. At the end of the shift, the five are taken to the worst accommodation levels at the bottom of the station. Others there are Hiker, a paraplegic in an exoskeleton, Gasher, a self-harming woman, Aborigine who paints the walls with primitive animal drawings, and a thin man called X-Ray. After lockdown, dogs roam the corridors. At night, Kuryu, sharing a cell with Domingo, threatens him to avoid being raped. Domingo snatches her shank away, then goes to sleep. Styles can't sleep and hears a sliding clawing sound. Next morning, Ivory's execution is broadcast over the station's CCTV system. He's not killed, however, and wakes up in a small windowless bunker. We cut to monitors showing claws, teeth and a tail, and Ivory is killed for real. At breakfast, Styles sits with X-Ray, who doesn't eat. He explained that if he only drinks water, then he won't be taken by whatever was making the noises the night before. In the foundry, a ship unloads rocks into a conveyor, and it becomes overloaded. Before the prisoners can be overwhelmed, Styles jams a shovel into the conveyor belt, stopping it. A guard grabs Styles and slams him against the wall, impaling his shoulder. While getting patched up in the infirmary, he angles to stay there and work, but the medic, Packard, sends him on his way. As he's about to leave, a stoned medtech drops a bunch of vials. Packard dismisses him and tells Dags to let Styles stay. While there, he encounters Reed, a sleazy biochemist who works in the P4 lab. Meanwhile, a water tanker docks with the station. That night, Domingo and Curieu wish each other good night, a friendship slowly forming. However, Hiker is attacked in his cell and killed. In another cell, X-Ray screams and the alien that killed Hiker dislocates its body parts to fit through the bars to reach him. Security turns up, led by Boss, with his two lieutenants, Left Nut and Right Nut. They track the alien to the machinery level below before losing it. Boss says to kill one of the guard dogs and make sure the prisoners see it. Next morning, Styles notices drawings on the wall of the Aborigine cell showing the alien. He quizzes Dags, who says the attack was by a rabbit dog. Styles presses the matter with Packard, but she's not interested. Company rep Lone arrives and meets with Warden Wells, the station captain, Reed and Reed's assistant Mole to view Ivory's death video. They discuss the rogue alien on the loose in the lower levels. Reed says a suicide gene should kick in soon, killing the creature. Wells is given a one-way ticket to a deep space outpost for her incompetence. That night, Styles studies Hiker's old cell, following where the water pipes go, and tries to stop the cell door closing with Hiker's exosuit. It's not strong enough and shatters. 
The prisoners discuss the need to move before they're killed by the alien, and Styles says they should escape the station entirely. They put a plan in action. Floor grates are gradually sawn open, glowworms collected from the ceiling, shower caps purchased from other prisoners, Hiker's suit is cannibalised, and taps are left on with the water running. One night, Styles tries a new, stronger rod to block the door and is successful in wrecking the mechanism. Meanwhile, bosses concocted a plan to use fast-setting resin charges, normally used to seal hull breaches, in order to trap the alien. They also arm themselves with armour-piercing rounds to be used in internal corridors only. In P4, Lone watches an alien floating in an artificial womb. As he leaves, we see him from the alien's point of view. In the infirmary, Styles is given an alcoholic spray for a rash on his hand. Packard's husband calls her to ask for a divorce. Styles asks if he can keep the spray. She relents and Dags warns him not to screw Packard around. When the water in the tap runs out, the five attempt to escape through the floor grates, through the machinery level and into an empty water pipe. Unbeknownst to them, the water tanker arrives early for once. They crawl through pipes, burning through gates with Styles' alcoholic spray as the water level starts to rise. They make it to the main water tank, but are then attacked by the rogue alien. It kills Grimes, then Domingo, then Curyu. Styles and Van Brunt reach a chamber at the top of the tank, but Van Brunt is killed by one of Boss's resin traps. The alien pursues before ultimately being killed by Boss's team, but not before the captain is killed by acid. The acid eats through the floor, and Styles falls into a room full of corpses, including ivories, and is met by Lone and recaptured. Packard berates Styles while he's shackled in solitary via a monitor, and he asks her if she really knows what's going on in P4. She cuts the hand off the dead captain and uses it to gain access to the secret lab, finding the alien womb and a lot of classified files, including one that has a picture of Ripley noting that she is deceased. There's also a video file of Ivory's death. When Mole comes up through a hatch in the floor, she hides, then sneaks down there once he's gone finding a cold storage chamber full of different types of alien. A hulking brute alien, a thorned alien, two fused together, one with chameleon traits, and many others. As she goes to leave, she's met by Mole, Reed, and Boss. Lone offers her a chance to join the project, or be paid off to keep her mouth shut. She opts for the latter, but while packing in her quarters, fishes out a video card she stole from P4. She watches a video feed of X-Ray being killed by the alien, and realises that everyone is expendable. Packard breaks Styles out, bluffing her way past a guard, insisting that he's dead. Dags discovers that Styles is gone, and when Lone realises what's happening, shuts everything down. A transport approaching the docking port is warned off. Boss and his special services guards show up and start firing, forgetting their firing armour-piercing ammo. Right Nut searches for a resin hole patching kit, but they've all been used for the alien traps. The dock is breached and the station begins to decompress, the outer airlock door blowing out and hitting the transport. It spirals out of control into the cell block and thousands are blown out into space. Packard and Styles manage to escape the decompression while Lone tells Reed to retrieve their data while he calls Gateway for help. After Reed leaves, Lone destroys all communications. With the station falling apart, the alien in P4 starts to wake up. While gathering data, Reed notices that it's gone. The new breed uses acid to burn through the wall and attacks him. In operations, Packard and Styles meet Dags and another guard. They reason that if Gateway has been alerted, it will take 30 minutes for them to arrive. The station only has 17 minutes of air left. Packard and Styles head to P4 to grab some pressure suits, while Dags and the guard try to get more air from an airlock's separate supply. On the way to P4, Packard and Styles spot Mole. Packard keeps going, but Styles decides to work out where Mole is headed. Packard gets the suits, but is stalked by the new breed. She puts on one of the suits and manages to evade the creature by hiding in one of the cold storage chambers, but fails to seal it, waking up a frozen alien. Mole hands the amberized face hugger to Lone and finds a gun aimed at him for his trouble. Elsewhere, Dags and the guard have ripped open the innards of an airlock, only to find that it uses the station's air supply. There's no extra oxygen to be had. Packard encounters the new breed alien again, but it's distracted by the now defrosted brute alien. They fight and the new breed rips the brute's spine out, enabling Packard to escape. Styles finds the dying mole and follows Lone to the docking port where the company rep has remotely activated a drone ship to pick him up. Styles steals the hugger and threatens to throw it over a ledge. 
Lone tries to make a deal, but Styles throws it anyway. Lone desperately tries to grab it, but also falls, impaling himself on a girder and revealing himself to be an android. Packard meets Dags and the guard back at operations and note that a ship is docked. They head to the foundry docking port, but are again attacked by the new breed. The guard is killed while Packard and Dags make it to the port, only to find Styles and the ship have gone. The new breed starts melting through the door as Styles arrives in an elevator. He used Lone's remote device to leave the ship two kilometres out to avoid debris from the disintegrating station. He activates the device and the ship approaches. The three pile into an airlock and the new breed forces them to evacuate while the ship is still 200 metres away. Tethered together, Styles can't get a grip on the hull and Packard breaks an antenna trying to hang on. Dags, however, manages to grab the sharp needle nose of the ship. Boarding, they find the new breed leaping out of the airlock after them. Styles manoeuvres the ship just in time for the alien to be impaled and killed on the nose. An ICC cutter approaches to pick them up. After a moment, Dags lies that Styles is a medtech. So, overall it's a pretty decent first draft of a sci-fi action script, with a number of exciting sequences as well as characters who have at least some semblance of a personality. The setting also works with the previous films. The third act is written to happen in real time and could potentially have worked quite well. There are a couple of problems, however. The first is that the aliens are almost entirely peripheral to the story. It's established in the first few pages that Styles has already escaped a number of prisons, so this movie is going to be all about him escaping this one. The aliens, rather than being integral, are just obstacles to him achieving that. They could be replaced with other obstacles without changing the story very much. Curiously, while many prison films are about escaping from prison, hence the escape from in so many titles, no one is trying to escape the prison in the final released version of the film. In fact, the escape angle has more similarities to Alien Resurrection, and not just characters trying to get away from a doomed facility in space. There's a scene of climbing through a flooded area while coming under alien attack, a chamber of horrors, a character getting sucked through a small hole, and a character being frozen in nitrogen slash resin. Not to say that Joss Whedon was consciously riffing on Tui, but he said via Twitter in 2019, in the context of Gibson's script being adapted into an audio drama, that David Tui's was his favourite of the rejected scripts. Tui would riff on himself to a degree, possibly also unconsciously, with the Riddick game Escape from Butcher Bay in 2004. The other main problem is Styles' struggle and recapture while killing off four major characters in quick succession. Bold, certainly, but it comes across as the film hitting a big reset button and having us go right back to where we started, rather than moving forward. The other characters are still thinly drawn, which is to be expected. Styles' motive for taking the other characters with him to escape is a little shaky. Curyu particularly has nothing to do. And Grimes, Van Brunt and Domingo have little to offer other than providing muscle and the odd bit of dark comic relief. Packard is hopelessly naive and very quick to trust Styles just after her husband has asked for a divorce and revealed to be cheating on her. Lone has some potential in that he doesn't seem to be an out-and-out monster, until he's rather predictably revealed to be an out-and-out monster. The rogue alien dislocating itself to get through narrow gaps is a cool addition, but unfortunately the creature is killed just before Styles is recaptured, rather than being taken through to the climax, and we get introduced to a whole new menagerie. Another odd aspect is Chekhov's centrifuge. We have a steel ingot being created, then launched from a centrifuge towards Earth, and a worker explains where it's going and will be picked up. Then we see it again later, then never again. Seems like it would have been a nifty device for the characters to escape or for Lone to dispatch alien specimens to Earth. Similarly, we're introduced to characters like Bellhop, who shows the prisoners to their cells, Gasher and the Aborigine, who play no further part in the story. Susan Russo is introduced with the five main prisoners at the start, but immediately disappears. In terms of the script legacy among later media, prison settings are practically non-existent, probably due to the concept being used in the final version of Alien 3. This was the first time, however, that the company first started actively experimenting on human subjects, which would become a staple, particularly in the comics and video games, as well as Alien Resurrection. People trying to escape disintegrating space stations feature in James Stocko's Dead Orbit comic and Alex White's novel The Cold Forge, even down to ships causing hull breaches. 
The alien menagerie isn't miles away from Eric Red's cow, pig and chicken aliens, nor is it miles away from the Kenner toy line. David Toohey turned in the script in October 1989. Fox liked it, but wasn't willing to make another alien film without Sigourney Weaver. So while Toohey started working Ripley into his script, Brandywine had watched Vincent Ward's film The Navigator, An Odyssey Across Time, and contacted him about directing. Ward wasn't keen on the existing Toohey script, so came up with his own story, which we will examine in the next episode. Brandywine liked Ward's ideas and put him with John Fasano to write a script. The plan was that they would write Alien 4, with Toohey writing Alien 3. However, if they finished theirs first, it would be Alien 3. Toohey wasn't officially told this, and when he found out, he slapped the rest of his script together and quit in disgust. He would later go on to considerable success writing The Fugitive and crafting the popular Riddick franchise with Vin Diesel. Guyla, Hill and Carroll had a director and a script, but were still a very long way from having a film.